Devil's Tower is a monstrous mound you can see from miles around. Little did we know that it would be surrounded by demons. So chubby, I Devil's Tower. Agabi spotted a guy in orange climbing it somewhere on the other side. Yeah. We're gonna try to get as close as we can to it. And then, uh, see what we can see. Devil's Tower is a gigantic igneous intrusion, or a lacolith, that juts out of the middle of the North American continent right here in eastern Wyoming. It rises drastically from the river around it, standing 876 feet from its base. By comparison, it is half the height of the Freedom Tower, or the One World Trade Center in New York City. It was declared the nation's first ever national monument in 1906 by... About one percent of all visitors end up climbing the tower. In pre-Columbian times, native tribes in the Great Plains were culturally and linguistically aware of Devil's Tower. It's amazing how far away some of these tribes are, considering they had no horses. If you think driving across some of these distances is boring, try doing it on foot. The Kiowa of the Southern Plains named Devil's Tower a loft on a rock. The Cheyenne near the tower named it Bear's House or Bear's Lair. The Crow to the northwest named the tower Home of Bears. The Lakota named the tower Bear's Lodge. The Arapaho to the southwest named it Bear's Teepee. There were other groups in the region that were also aware of its existence. Many of these groups still practice religious gatherings around the tower even to this day. If you can see a pattern here, it's because the native religious origin story of the tower almost always includes a bear. One Lakota origin story of the tower states it was created when several women were being chased by a bear and they had asked the Great Spirit to help them. The Great Spirit had lifted the tower out of the earth and out of the bear's reach. The bear scraped at the tower, leaving large claw marks. The women were then lifted into the heavens by the Great Spirit and became the constellation Pleiades. The monument is also a hotspot for controversy between the native tribes on one side and tourists and the U.S. federal government on the other. The Devil's Tower Monument is considered a sacred religious site for many of the local tribes, including the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Kiowa tribes. In years past, climbing the monument was seen as an insult to the native tribes' holy site. As a compromise, there is a voluntary ban on climbing the tower during the month of June when many of the native tribes' religious ceremonies are held. 
During June, 85% of climbers honor the ban. As for the other 15%, several climbers and the Mountain States Legal Foundation have sued the Park Services claiming there is an issue regarding the separation of church and state in that ban. Even if it's voluntary. There has also been some controversy behind the monument's name. In 1875, a native translator had misinterpreted the name of the tower as Bad God Tower, giving it its current name of Devil's Tower. Native tribes in the region have made several attempts to change the name to Bear Lodge to reflect its original pre-Columbian name. Due to fears that a change in the name would ruin the brand name of the monument and bring economic hardship to the area, a name change has come to pass. There are still attempts to this day. There are many traditions that take place at the sacred site. Prayers are done as individuals or as groups. The rituals are private religious functions, not public events, so it would be insensitive to observe them without permission. There are pipe ceremonies, dancing ceremonies, and ribbon tying rituals. We noticed around the base of the tower there was an abundance of prayer cloths, ribbons, and bundles tied to trees and bushes. These bundles are seen as symbolic representations of prayers. Visitors of the park are specifically told not to disturb the bundles in any way. I will mention one last oral tradition regarding this Native American sacred location. Much like how many Western and Middle Eastern religions, both alive and dead, have their interpretation of the Great Flood, many of the Great Plains tribes have their Great Race religious tale. The legend is about the Red Racetrack, a circular depression around the Black Hills. There was once a contest between bison and man to see who will be Earth's most powerful animal. To settle the bet, a race was to be held in what would go in a large circle. The race lasted so long that the land was flattened out and a mound had been raised in the middle of the track. This mound is what we know today as the Black Hills. Because they had been racing so tirelessly, the contestants had begun to bleed out of their nostrils and their mouths. This blood stained the sand, creating the red sands that you can also see around the finish line at the base of Devil's Tower. Considering there is no other animal biologically capable of walking or running the distances that humans can do, it would make sense that we won a race based on distance and endurance. On the same side of the token, without horses to hunt, it's been agreed on that our ancestors in the old world had chased down their prey to hunt them over long distances as well. Our hike around Devil's Tower was amazing. We were really able to feel the energy of the place. We listened to nature. And talked with fellow travelers. As soon as we saw the sun was starting to tilt toward the west, we knew it was time to ride back to our campsite. It's a shame that the amount of travel we're allotted is so short in our daily lives. There's so much to see in this great big world of ours. Every time we pass a location, even if it's not for the first time, we can find something new and exciting. So this is literally the four corners we're talking about. I should have known, looking at all the uh, street signs that were going in this direction, that they didn't mention four corners at all. But uh, we're about halfway home. We're making very good time, too. We stopped to stretch our legs at this Four Corners crossing. As it turns out, this location was the site of one of the most daring robberies of the Wild West. There's lots of history right here under our nose. As we wandered around, we came across a sign. This plaque marks the spot of the site of the Treasure Run coach robbery that was at the Canyon Spring Station here at this location in September of 1878. It begins with John Hurley or Lame Johnny. He was a famous outlaw of the Black Hills region. How he got to the Dakota Territory is not well known. His name is Lame Johnny on account of his deformed foot that he disguised with an extra high heel in his boot. He had a known limp. It is known he attended college in Philadelphia, but it didn't work out for him, so he went to Texas instead to become a cowboy. His limp wouldn't allow him to become a cowboy, so he began horse stealing instead, which in Texas was punishable by hanging in those days. Lame Johnny then moved from Texas to the Black Hills region when things got too hot down south. In the Black Hills, he became a sheriff until somebody had recognized him as a horse thief from Texas. He fled again and created a band of outlaws bent on stagecoach robbing the gold from the mines he was once protecting. 
It was then he and his band of outlaws staged the idea of robbing the Monitor. The Monitor was a special treasure coach that had 5 16 inches of iron plate, loopholes for guns, and a safe bolted to the floor. In essence, it was an armed vehicle of the Wild West. Millions of dollars in gold were mined from the Black Hills and the stage companies were desperate to protect it. The Monitor was guarded by Daniel Boone May, the fastest gun in Dakota Territory. The Monitor arrived at the Canyon Springs station, but no one came outside to meet the crew. Instead, the crew of the Monitor was met by gunfire. Aboard the Monitor, one was killed and the driver was badly wounded. The messenger, riding shotgun, killed one of the outlaws and fatally wounded another. The safe inside was a salamander safe, whose warranty stated it could not be cracked in less than six days without the combination. During the shootout, the outlaws made off with the monitor and the safe inside and put it into the woods and cracked it under two hours. The gold and jewelry in that safe was $27,000 or $1.7 million in today's currency. Of all the gold that came out of the Black Hills through Denwood, this was the only successful raid on one of their stagecoaches. Word got out as far as New York City and a piece was put on Lame Johnny in the New York Times. In the aftermath, the bandits made off with much of the loot, but were all eventually caught or died in a massive manhunt. Some of the outlaws even returned to Deadwood to cash in some of the gold, which ended in subsequent hanging. There is 40% of that gold that was in the monitor that is still said to be hidden somewhere within the Dakota Territory. Lame Johnny was caught as well by a detective by the name of Frank Whispering Smith. As Johnny was being brought back to Deadwood to be tried and hanged, Daniel Boone May, the quickest pistol in the Dakota Territory, rode alongside the shackled outlaw. Then one day, Boone was gone. That same day, masked vigilantes stopped the coach and Johnny was freed from his shackles. It was thought that he'd escaped with the help of his outlaws, but it turns out the vigilantes that had saved him hanged him on a cottonwood tree by a creek which now bears his name. This is one of the many legends of the Wild West, a lawless land where people had survived on their wits alone. I'll leave that story of Lame Johnny as a good night tale for the episode. If you'd like to hear more tales, please subscribe. History is important to me and I plan on telling the tales of the places I visit throughout my videos. Thank you very much for watching Two Wheels, One Compass.